The listening part of the occupational English test has three parts, and in each part, you will hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beep sound. You have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract only once. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you will hear two different extracts. In each extract, a healthcare professional is talking to his patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. You hear a neurologist talking to a new patient called Mrs. Lizavita. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, doctor. Good morning, Mrs. Lisavita. Could you tell me what the problem is? I have a mild gait impairment and cognitive slowing, doctor. What's your age? 71, doctor. I think I walk in a funny manner. Actually, my husband has noticed this over the past three months and says I have broadened my base and have developed stoop posture. My balance has also started declining. I have to use walls or furniture to stabilize myself. However, I'm not using any kind of assistive device. So what about your bowel and bladder movements? I do not have any issues, doctor. No frequency issues or urgency. Do you have any headaches? No, doctor. Have you experienced any change or decrease in your memory or thinking? It is not as smart as it used to be earlier. However, I am able to pay the bills. My thinking has slowed down. I often get stuck with the words when I speak. Have you ever had any trouble with syncope or vertigo? I don't have any trouble with syncope, but I've had some episodes of vertigo. I was diagnosed with hypertension in 2014, but no snoring or apnea. Any other complications? I've had arthritis since 2000 and thyroid abnormalities since 1975. Have you had any surgery? Well, I had a hysterectomy in 1992 and a wrist operation after I fell down in 1972 with a titanium plate and six screws. All right, can you give me a brief history of any illness in your family? My mother had colon cancer. Are you allergic to any medicines? Yes, codeine and sulfa. What medications are you taking now? Premarin, 0.625 milligrams, Asifex, 20 milligrams daily, Toprol, 50 milligrams daily, Norvasc, 5 milligrams daily, multivitamin, Caltrate Plus D, B-complex vitamins, calcium and magnesium, and vitamin C daily. Well, after reviewing all of your medical reports, I doubt that you've developed adult hydrocephalus. Your diagnosis reports show blood pressure 154 over 72, and your heart rate's 87, and the weight 153, and your pain is 0 out of 10. Your spine is straight and non-tender, and you have very mild kyphosis, but no scoliosis. And your gait assessment shows that you have some unsteadiness and a widened base. I've reviewed all your x-ray reports since 2009, and it shows a mild ventriculomegaly with trace expansion into the temporal horns. The sylvian aqueduct appears to be patent. Your corpus callosum appears to be bowed and effaced. You have developed a couple of small T2 signal abnormalities, but no prominent changes in the paraventricular signal. I should have your cerebral spinal fluid leakage tested through lumbar punch method. With this test, I can assess your response to shunt surgery. There is a mild risk of meningitis of 2 to 3%. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. 
You hear a physician talking to a patient. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Hello, Jamila. Can you brief me about your health issue? Yes, doctor. Actually, I approached a physician about my abdominal pain eight months back. On my chest x-ray, I had a possible infiltrate, and he thought that I might have pneumonia, and I was treated with some antibiotics and prednisone. However, the symptoms improved for a short period only, and it didn't cure my disease completely. Besides, my pain had worsened by the end of the month, and I was admitted to an emergency ward. This time my chest x-ray was compatible with pleurisy, and I was treated with Percocet. However, I was given another prescription for Ultram since I had nausea and was vomiting with Percocet. Eventually, I was referred to another doctor and was diagnosed with splenomegaly. A repeat ultrasound showed an enlarged spleen of 19 centimeters. My positron emission tomography scanning showed diffuse hypermetabolic lymph nodes of 1 to 2 centimeters diameter and an enlarged hypometabolic spleen. Finally, I had my lymph node biopsy on the right side of my neck last month, and mantle cell lymphoma was detected. Two weeks ago, I had a bone marrow biopsy that showed involvement of bone marrow with lymphoma and also circulating lymphoma cells on peripheral smear. And your age? 45, doctor. Okay. What medications are you taking? Estradiol, Prometrium, 200 milligrams, Ultram, whenever I get pain, baby aspirin, Lunestra for sleeping, and iron supplements. Are you allergic to any medicine? No, doctor. Tell me about your previous medical history. Yes, doctor. I got my tubal ligation in 2001, and a cyst from the left side of my neck was surgically removed in 2005. I had tonsillectomy, and I get occasional migraines. Do you smoke or drink? No, doctor. May I know your job profile? Well, I'm working as a project manager. Tell me, is there any family history of diseases? My father had emphysema and colon cancer when he was 68, and my mother has hypertension and arrhythmia. Well, your heat diagnosis shows the oropharynx is benign. There is shoddy adenopathy in your neck, though, and your abdomen is soft and non-tender and shows the palpable spleen approximately 10 centimeters below the right coastal margin. Your mantle cell lymphoma is confirmed, and I would advise that you should go for chemotherapy with hyperfractionated cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone, doxorubicin, and vincristin. Discontinue aspirin for now and continue estradiol and permetrium. Take Ativan as and when you feel anxiety. You'll be given allopurinol from today and hydration further so that you can avoid tumor lysis syndrome. I will plan to add Rituzan a little later on in your course since you have circulating lymphoma cells and I'm planning to get you evaluated for bone marrow transplant in first remission. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a dietitian talking to a patient. Now read the question.
So what seems to be the problem? I feel such a failure. I'm sure people think that if I just tried harder, I could lose weight. Maybe I need more willpower. Well, firstly, well done for seeking medical help. Actually, being overweight or obese is a medical problem, because being overweight changes how your body works. Oh, thanks, but I do feel that it's my fault for being this way. Well, I hear what you say, but please understand that these days we consider that obesity is a disease, <laughs> like high blood pressure or asthma. You see, the body's signals to the brain stop working correctly when you're overweight, and with time you feel less full, even if you eat the same amount. And when you cut calories, your body tries to use less energy to keep your weight the same. Question 26. You hear members of a hospital committee discussing problems in the X-ray department. Now read the question. So next on the agenda is the problems in the x-ray department. Nick, would you like to fill us in here? Well, as you all know, this is a very busy department. Uh, so we have four x-ray machines in all, including one in the fracture and orthopedic clinic area. But recently, one of the other x-ray machines developed a fault. And so we had to apply for authorization for the purchase of a new tube for it. There's been some kind of hold up with the paperwork and while we've been waiting, patients are being brought into the fracture and orthopedic area for x-rays there instead. And of course, that's causing further congestion. Question 27. You hear a senior nurse giving feedback to a trainee after a training exercise. Now read the question. OK, that went quite well, didn't it? But it took you a while to work out where the CPR board was kept. Yeah. So what does that tell you about this scenario? We need to check where things are before doing anything else. Exactly. And, of course, it takes a second or two to put the head of the bed down because you've got to have that part of the bed flat before you slip the board in. I wish there was a quicker way. So do I put the CPR board under or would I normally hand it over to somebody else? It makes no difference as long as it's done. Question 28. You hear a trainee nurse asking his senior colleague about the use of anti-embolism socks for a patient. Now read the question. I noticed that Mrs Jones isn't wearing the usual anti-embolism socks, but I didn't want to ask her why not, because she was asleep. Is it because her legs are swollen? Well, sometimes we don't recommend the socks if there's severe swelling with edema, but that's not the case here. Mrs Jones was actually given them initially on admission last night, but she told us this morning that her lower legs were feeling numb. She described it as having no feeling. Until we've checked out the reason for that, for example, it could be an underlying condition which could damage her arterial circulation. We're reducing the risk of thrombosis by pharmacological means. Oh, I see. Question 29. You hear a vet talking about her involvement in the management of the practice where she works. Now read the question. Uh, 
At first, when I took over the financial running of the practice, I felt rather thrown in at the deep end. I really needed to know my stuff and be super organised, especially with the number of new drugs and treatments available now, all of which have to be very carefully costed. It keeps me super busy, but monitoring stocks and so on helps give me confidence and allows me to see how everything fits into the overall picture of working as a vet. My manager's more than happy to leave me to run this side of things. He's in overall charge, of course, but I can always go to him if there's a problem. I keep him closely informed of what's happening. He's always pleased if I manage to make savings anywhere. Question 30. You hear a physiotherapist giving a presentation about a study she's been involved in. Now read the question. I'm a physiotherapist, and I'm presenting our poster about constraint-induced movement therapy for children suffering from partial paralysis following brain surgery. We did a case series of four children who'd all undergone hemispherectomies. They were admitted to inpatient therapy within two weeks post-op and began therapy two to three weeks post-op. The therapy continued after they were discharged. Our findings were that three of the kids regained excellent function and mobility with ambulation and upper extremity function. One didn't do so well, unfortunately, but he gave up the therapy early on. This type of movement therapy has been used a lot in adult populations following stroke. The findings here promote moving forward with further research on the pediatric or adolescent population following either hemispherectomy or other surgeries, to help us decide how appropriate this therapy would be for them. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. Questions 31 to 42. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear an interview with Dr. Christine Erickson, who's talking about her research supporting non-fasting lipid blood tests for cholesterol. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
Hello and welcome to Health Research Roundup. For decades, people have been asked to fast before they have blood tests to check cholesterol levels. However, a new research report from an international group of experts suggests that this is not necessary. To discuss this research, my guest today is Christine Erickson from Copenhagen University Hospital, who was a lead author of the study. Christine, welcome. Thank you very much. So why did we ever ask people to fast for blood lipids, for your blood fats? Well, if you ask me, I don't really know, except for that's what we've been doing for so many years. I really tried to read the literature and find some very scientific evidence supporting that it is superior to just taking a random non-fasting blood sample as we do now. And I had problems finding the evidence. There's a lot of arguments people put forward for why you should use fasting versus non-fasting, but really solid evidence that is better, I can't find it. So was this a tradition rather than science? I think so, yes. I mean, you can ask me why did it start. I think that some of the early studies, the original publications way back, said that they used fasting samples and therefore everybody thought you had to do that without really thinking why. But those early researchers may have had good reason to do it that way, but there's nothing I've seen that said it had to be done that way. And there's all this evidence now from Canada and the US, two excellent studies, one in children and one in adults. And then we have a lot of studies from Copenhagen, and they all show that when you just look at people that eat and drink whatever they usually do, and you take a lipid panel, cholesterol triglycerides, a very common fat in the blood, then they don't really change very much in response to when you have been eating. So there is a difference? Yeah, the difference is in millimoles per litre. So it goes up by about 0.3 millimoles per litre. However, in clinical practice, when you look at triglycerides, you're interested in whether it increases are 1 or 2 millimoles, not 0.3 millimoles. So that's what's clinically relevant. And even with a bad form of cholesterol, that's not going to make the difference between whether or not they put you on medication? Yeah, that's right. Uh, we provide data in this report where we did direct measurement and after fasting and in about 6,000 people and the correlation between the two methods was, I can't see the difference. It looks exactly the same. So you moved over in Denmark to this official recommendation about seven years ago. So what's happened since then? Have there been any issues because of undiagnosed cholesterol levels? No, everybody was happy right away. Even the laboratories that didn't change right away, they were pushed by patients because there were reports in the media telling them that at Copenhagen University Hospital, we're doing non-fasting, so everyone wanted to do it. And I can say today, patients, clinicians, laboratories, everyone's happy. Everyone likes it because it's so much simpler. And patients like it because they can go when it suits them to the pathologist, so they're more likely to turn up for their blood tests? Yes, of course. I don't have fantastic good numbers for you, but certainly you hear from so many colleagues that people don't go to have their lipid test because it's so complicated to fast. And then they have to go to work to have an important meeting and they can't do this in the morning. But now doing a random non-fasting, you can come whenever it suits you. And very briefly, is there any circumstance where you should have a fasting blood fat level done? Well, this recommendation, it's 21 world experts, many from Europe, the US, and one from Australia also. And of course, when you have so many experts, there's always someone that thinks there's certain situations. We list a few where you can do. For example, for patients with diabetes, the fasting requirements might be an important safety issue because of problems with hyperglycemia. But if you ask me way down in my heart? Is it necessary? I don't really think so. Now turn over and look at extract two. Extract two, questions 37 to 42. You hear a presentation in which a researcher called Dr. Milan Petrusevic is talking about the relationship between new technology and medicine in the future. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
Hi, I'm Dr. Milan Petrisevich, and today I'd like to talk about the future of medicine, particularly in relation to the current technological revolution. To many of us, it seems inevitable that medical robots, automation, and artificial intelligence will replace many jobs in healthcare. Surgical robots are becoming increasingly more precise, and right now, man-sized robots can lift and move patients and transport them throughout a hospital. Silicon Valley investor Vinod Kozla once said, technology would replace 80% of doctors because machines will be more accurate, objective, and cheaper than the average doctor. He added that eventually we won't need doctors at all. However, I disagree. Instead, I think technology in some specialties will finally allow doctors to focus on what makes them good physicians, treating patients and innovating, while automation does the repetitive part of the work. So let's look at some examples of how different areas of medicine will benefit from current technological advances. Take general practitioners as an example. Many doctors choose this specialty today because they have a chance to make a long-term impact on someone's life. And it's true that GPs enjoy tremendous trust from their patients. But seeing someone only when they are sick makes it hard to prevent disease and ensure someone's long-term well-being. It's even harder to do this when waiting rooms are overflowing and you only have 15 minutes to diagnose the illness, design a therapy, and offer health advice. In the future, wearable sensors and devices that stream data to a doctor's smartphone will notify them whenever vital signs are acting up and provide them with all the data they need wherever they are. These devices will also ensure doctors only treat patients who really need professional care, making it possible to offer simple treatment advice remotely. In turn, this will increase the time GPs have to treat and advise each patient, building trust and ensuring patients act on a doctor's advice. What's more, smart algorithms will allow GPs to tap expert advice on their patients' conditions and act as a gatekeeper, connecting patients to other specialties. And these are just a few examples. So what about radiology? Well, already IBM's medical sieve shows how artificial intelligence algorithms can scan hundreds of radiology images in seconds, doing the repetitive job of finding malignant or out-of-place phenomenon that currently radiologists have to do daily. This technology won't replace this important specialty. Instead, radiologists will have time to supervise how the algorithm is doing, or to research and innovate, making the technology behind these devices even better. Their time will be much more productive, rather than spent checking hundreds of x-rays a day. Ophthalmology will bring science fiction technologies to patients in the near future. Retinal implants might give vision back to those who have lost it, or even give human supervision, augmenting what we can already do. In sports medicine and rehabilitation, the first forms of activity records from tech like Fitbits all focused on people who exercised regularly, but only provided basic insight into how they were performing. Now, a new generation of devices tailored to professional athletes is hitting the market with apps providing detailed insights into movement patterns and force output in any movement. Sports medicine physicians will have concrete data to measure how athletes are improving. By the time these reach the mainstream public, sophisticated algorithms will be ready to analyze data from these devices and provide personalized suggestions to improve performance and to speed up recovery. Similarly, video consoles from Xbox to Microsoft Connect will offer a way of monitoring how a patient is doing from a distance by seeing their progress liquidly on a screen. In oncology, this specialty will pave the way for personalized medicine. Even now, oncologists customize therapies to a patient's genetic background and their tumor's molecular makeup. Cheaper genome sequencing and measuring blood biomarkers are speeding up this process, with companies like Grail working on fluid biopsies which could filter tumor cells from blood samples. Tumors could soon be diagnosed earlier and analyzed without costly surgery. What's more, artificial intelligence could soon be used to help oncologists understand and even cure cancer. Already, IBM Watson obtains all the relevant information from millions of studies about a patient's case and makes suggestions for treatment plans most likely to work. In the meantime, patients are better informed about the disease thanks to social media communities of fellow patients. These signs all point to a bright future for oncology in partnership with new tech innovations. So what does this all point to? Well, my conclusion would be that, all in all, many jobs will be taken over by robots and automation in the coming years, but at the same time, amazing opportunities will also emerge, especially in medicine. These will require physicians to acquire new skills and improve their existing ones. 
In my opinion, the majority of specialties will have more time for patients and better insight into disease.